Hi there team and welcome to this update on the geologic unrest that continues on the Reykjanes Peninsula in Iceland. I am geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me today. It is Saturday, September 7th, about 8.45 a.m. here Mountain Daylight Time, 2.45 p.m. in Iceland. And it's been several days since I did my last update. In fact, I believe it was my flight that I did with Isaac, um, Isak, sorry. Uh, over the eruption as it was kind of dying down and waning a little bit. The eruption is officially over as declared by the Met Office with no incandescent uh, lava coming out of the vents at all. So we're going to go ahead and look at some of the data, look forward a little bit and do a little bit of a, a debrief on things that have been going on the last uh, few days or so. So thanks for joining me. As a quick uh, reminder before we get started, I do have some field trips coming up. These are available on my website, willseegeology.com. I'll put a link under the video description. Uh, if you can find your way to the northern Utah area around Salt Lake City, I have three really awesome field trips at the end of September, the 27th to the 29th. You can come on one of the days or all three, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, so I'd like to see some more folks uh, show up for those if possible, get signed up, that'd be great. And then I have a, a host of field trips in October, the 11th to the 13th here in Southern Idaho, Craters of the Moon, City of Rocks, uh, some of the volcanoes in the area and then a couple dates around Twin Falls in November. So just want to remind you and make you aware of that. Hope to see you there. Uh, so you can see with, from the webcam here, the vent, the actual um, sort of, I guess, merged spatter cone construct that, ir that resulted from this past eruptive event. A Little bit of maybe moss uh, burning along the edge here, but this eruption is officially over. We'll go ahead and jump right to the Met Office update from yesterday and there it is at the top the eruption is over uh, no visible activity at the craters at the vents uh, they know they note that ground uplift has started again and we'll talk a little bit about that the eruption appears to have lasted about two weeks about 14 days and they have a new hazard map as well that we'll we'll take a look at in fact let's go ahead and check out that hazard map the main thing was they dropped some of the hazard levels down um, now that the eruption is over so eruption or the hazard levels have dropped a little bit here. Uh, I believe they extended this all a little bit further to the northeast as well, just given the further northern uh, reach of this last eruptive event. Uh, so you can see those zones here uh, and then the associated hazards listed over here to the left. Uh, back to the Met Office update. They did have, um, this was I think from the previous update, uh, maybe on Thursday the 5th, they did put out one last flow map and you can see just a little bit of activity here on that northern flow lobe, just kind of where it progressed over the last week or so, the 28th of August, uh, all the way up to, it looks like the last date they have here is September 4th. But basically, um, you know, it slowed down and now there's just essentially no movement along that flow lobe there. Uh, we'll come back to this linear feature here that I talked a little bit about and we flew over in ESAC's flight last Tuesday. I've got some thoughts and a diagram I want to share with you as, as to what might be going on there. Um, uh, let's see, yeah, hazard map we looked at. So um, yeah, Med Office, uh, now that we're in between eruptive events, we'll start looking towards uh, the GPS and the ground deformation to see what might be going on. Um, here is the Met Office's uh, last graph of the inflation that's going on. So the red line here at the bottom is the time since this last eruption started on August 22nd. And you can see how closely it's mirroring the track of initial deflation or down dropping and then kind of leveling out and then the inflation that took place. This green line here is our eruptive event that happened on um, May 29th. And so we're tracking very closely with that. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, do, do, does the next event, um, you know, need as much time as that event did to recharge fully and produce an eruption, which was a good 85 or so days um, beyond the previous eruption. So that if that was the case, that would definitely put us into winter time, probably sometime in December without figuring it out and looking at a calendar. Um, so we'll have to see how that looks moving forward. And of course, we'll, it'd be fun to check out Bruce Garner's, our view, one of our good viewers who puts together some of his projections and forecasts based on some of the um, 
numeric analysis he does with the eruption. So we'll have to see how that plays out moving forward. But for now, it would appear as if we're in a lull between eruptions that might last uh, several months, uh, well into the winter time and maybe getting us into the last month of the year. As we um, look at the GPS data, you can see pretty, whoops, pretty nicely here. Get myself out of the way again. Um, looking at the Svartsengi station, there's the uplift uh, culminating with the August 22nd eruption when the GPS station moved downward as magma moved out of the subsurface storage chamber and onto the surface that um, was detected with this downdrop in the elevation of the GPS station. And since then, you can see it initially dropped down for maybe a week or so, kind of bottomed out, but now there's a clear trend upwards. We've got a nice little sort of uh, concave, I guess, uh, trend in the data here. And the assumption is that we'd expect to see this continue upward um, and follow this last eruptions uh, path. It's pretty much the same uh, look at all the other stations. When you look at the other stations, you see the same, the same trend, in, you know, a week or so of down dropping subsidence at the station, maybe a few days where it was maybe leveled off a little bit, and then a clear sign here of inflation or uplift. So it, it would appear um, that we have magma influx into the system that's resumed. Uh, the eruption has stopped, and so we're seeing that magma storage zone starting to refill in the subsurface. So clear signs of inflation. Earthquakes, not much to report. In fact, it's very quiet around the eruption site now that the, uh, which would be about here, now that the eruption is over, um, there's really no pressure or stress on the rocks that would cause them to break. There's no magma forcing cracks wider or really impinging on those in that subsurface environment and causing any sort of earthquake activity. So uh, very quiet and we'd expect that to continue moving forward. Um, one thing though to keep checking on is if we see earthquake activity pick up in some other area in this region uh, that could possibly be indicative of you know magma finding a new pathway. But first we'd expect to see the storage zone refilling over the next month or two and little to no earthquake activity associated with that based on what we've seen in the past. Um, the week of earthquakes, again, pretty quiet, just a couple here. Those, and those are older ones, probably associated with the last few uh, waning events at the active vent before it kind of died off a few days ago. Random quakes over here near the Fagradalsfjall area. We've seen those in the past. A um, few quakes over here near Krišuvik, but again, pretty scattered kind of just background noise that we'd expect along this active plate boundary. Um, so earthquakes, and then the other thing is this map that I often uh, like looking at that's, I guess, put out by the Met Office and some other, um, it's a consortium of these other organizations up here. Uh, they've updated their map to include this latest uh, lava flow from this August eruption, August 22nd eruption. So there's the two vents that were active the longest and you can see their, their flow field here. Um, you can come up here to data and you can even, they've even added things like, um, uh, they've added the hazard zones from the Met Office, which is kind of cool. So you can actually see exactly where those are. I think this is the, the, the hazard zones previous to the last one. I don't know if that's the most recent one. Um, but lots of great stuff there. Just a, a nice overlay of different spatial information that you can throw in here. Roads, uh, the berms themselves, uh, different lava outlines from different eruptive events. So you can come in here and see what the lava field looked like. Uh, if we take out the August one, you could throw in, let's say, um, which one should we pick? The January one, January 15th. So that throws that lava field down here near Grindavik onto the map. So uh, fun stuff. Maps are fun. Maps are good. Don't forget that. Um, and I think that's it. So what I want to do to wrap up this update is go back to, uh, let's use the Met Office map. That's probably as good as anything I might show. So remember on my flight, my drone flight with ESAC, which was uh, really awesome and I, I hope will, and I would expect we'll continue to collaborate. So for those of you that were there and enjoyed that, um, when we 
when we have time and are able to get our schedules coordinated, look for that again. But I was really interested in, and I had him fly straight out rather than flying out to the vents, which is kind of where all the action is and where most people are interested. I really wanted to look at this feature here because another viewer, Aston, who lives in um, Iceland, um, had sent me some imagery that suggested that this was a fault feature, uh, a fault scarp. I even talked about it in one of the other updates and that this was the uplifted side of the fault. This over here where the lava is, is was the downdrop side and that uh, this was a little bit of a valley here, a graben, and that the lava had gone around it here. This weird geometry existed because the lava had run up against this this barrier, this wall, and flowed around it. Um, and so that was pretty cool and intriguing. But when we actually got there, um, what we saw was a big, was it kind of the opposite. I thought I, I would see, you know, a clear uh, cliff face and then lava lapping up on that had lapped up onto it and then filled it partly. Um, but what we actually saw was that this side here was the side that was high where the lava was and the line was wasn't perfectly straight i mean and even if you get in here and look at this in in detail it's not uh, a perfect line you can see it kind of has a little bit of form and shape to it um, but what we saw was that this was the high side had formed a ridge and that this was actually the low side so let me take you to a diagram that might explain it and i'm open to other interpretations here as well that might work so let me take you to um let's get this thing adjusted just so uh there we go so is that straight yeah there we go so the idea here would be um initially we have uh here's this fault scarp here and here's the lava pouring out from the vent to the southeast and then moving towards that fault scarp that little cliff face there uh, that existed previously and then once the lava gets to it, it fills in this space. But a lot of times what we see with these lava flows is as they run into an obstacle like this, they'll actually inflate. So the lava is actually, this upper crust is flexible. It's not completely cooled at this point. And so the lava is inflating and becoming thicker as it fills this low area adjacent to the fault. And then ultimately, and again, I apologize for the lousy artwork here, um, that cooled crust as the lava continues to inflate now this area is higher topographically than it was before so we've actually sort of it's a case of topographic inversion i guess what was once low this valley here on the downdrop side of the fault ends up being actually a higher topographic um, feature than the other side of the fault here so we flew right over this thing and saw this kind of pile of rubble um, that really wasn't perfectly linear, but it was pretty close. And it definitely showed that the lava hadn't advanced out across this way, that it had actually stopped. Um, and so one possible interpretation that I'm trying to show here is that that lava had actually cooled um, and there just wasn't any more lava supply. Once it built up, inflated, and then started kind of spilling over the top of the fault, uh, the rest of it started cooling and we had this established out, outer crust around it there. So um, anyway, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, but it just at least is an interpretation that is in keeping and in line with uh, what we saw there with the drone flight. So that had just been kind of bugging me. I couldn't really, you know, on the on the fly, I didn't want to like start speculating too much, but in giving it a little bit more thought after the fact, uh, that's something possible I came up with. So um, anyway, so thank you again for joining me for this update. I will, of course, put together others as we move forward. They might be spaced out a bit more because now we're definitely in sort of the the doldrums between the eruptions in terms of activity, but certainly if anything important happens, I will let you know. And so thanks for your support of the channel. Thanks for joining me and we'll see you next time. Take care.